Hello, I'm Paul Briley, and you're listening to Off the Comma. I'm a human who cares about supporting other humans. On this podcast, we explore all facets of what it means to feel stuck in life. We talk with people just like us who found themselves sitting on a comma and not knowing where to go next. We'll unpack the experience with them, where they've been stuck, what it feels like, what they experienced, and what they learned. My goal is to inspire you by seeing yourself in others. I believe that when we feel more connected and seen, magic can happen. And remember, if you find yourself sitting on a comma in your life, you can also talk to me without a microphone. To explore coaching with me and getting off the comma in your own life, check out my information and book a call with me at offthecomma.com. And I'm also doing something different. I'm curating my own sponsor community, local businesses and professionals who I handpick and who align with our vision here. Be sure to check them out, learn more about them on my website and my YouTube channel. In the meantime, let's get into this week's conversation conversation. All right, we are back again with another cool episode of Off the Comma this week. And I'm particularly excited because this week I get to interview my Spanish tutor. So I have been working with Gustavo for many months now. um, And I've kind of been in the role of the pupil. And he's been learning a lot about me through the experience of uh, Spanish lessons. And now we get to kind of flip the switch and turn the tables. I get to learn a little bit more about Gustavo as a person person and hear more about his story and so forth. So I'm kind of rambling, but I'm particularly excited about um, this week's episode. So uh, we have with us Gustavo Von Ziegler from Mexico. Mm -hmm. And Gustavo, I'm going to turn it over to you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Start with like, how would you like to be known and then share anything else you'd like for us to know about you? Sure, absolutely. Well, I go by the pronouns he, him. My name is Gustavo. Uh, I'd like to be called just that, Gustavo. I'm 27 years old. I'm from Mexico. Uh, I'm a Spanish teacher, although I also teach English and Portuguese and a couple of other languages, both online or and also offline. And I've been doing that for a couple of years now. That's been my main job. Before, I used to work in customer service for some international companies and did some international work with different companies. And I've been doing this teaching lifestyle for the last few years. So uh, I have to say as well uh, with this introduction part of the conversation that I'm a big fan of the podcast of The Comma. Mm -hmm. I've been listening to it for quite some time now. And I have to say that uh, it's, it's something that I listen to pretty much every night. I find it extremely relaxing, especially because everybody knows Paul's voice is suiting, right? <laughs> So I'm a big fan and I'm also excited to be here, most definitely. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And I, I take that uh, in the spirit that it was delivered. I, I'm very grateful for that. And and I'm excited to have you here. Gustavo, if you were going to use some adjectives to describe yourself as a person, like tell us a little bit about who you are as a person. If I were to use some adjectives, I would say that I'm a person who is very determined I'm a very hard worker and I take pride in that. I uh, work a lot. I'm a person who in general is curious, curious about the world, about languages, about Mm. different people, about different topics. Uh, And I'm, I like to say that I'm always learning new stuff. So I'm somebody that is always learning new stuff. I like to learn new stuff and explore different aspects of life. And that's how I'm known. Everybody knows me as a guy who's always traveling, who's always learning new stuff. So I can never be at a single place for a long period of time. Uh, so I would say I the best way to describe me is a world traveler and in all aspects, not just traveling, mm-hmm. but uh, culturally as well, language wise as well, experience wise as well. That's how I would put it myself. Yeah, it's awesome. This is one of the things that I really just have to acknowledge you for that I think is so cool about you and that I admire and look up to is like, even without those descriptions, the fact that you know, you described what, at least five languages that you speak? Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and you've told me before that you're learning more, like you have, you have plans more to learn more course. like that in and of itself is world traveling. Right. Cause one of the things that I've noticed, you know, I'm still very much a novice in terms of learning my, my, my Espanol, 
uh, pero, and I know I, I told myself, like, I've got to try to resist the temptation with you to go <laughs> dip in and out of Spanish because I'm not good enough to be able to have the conversation in Spanish. And, and it's just going to sound like I'm like showboating or whatever. But, um, but what I've learned it just in my own exploration of just one other language is it's not just learning the language, right? You learn a little bit about the culture and we can take some of that at face value. But when you have to deconstruct a language in order to be able to understand it and then try to understand why was it built that way, then it forces you to then have to say, well, because this is how that culture thinks or these are what those cultural norms are or this is this is kind of what the context was at the time that the language was built that way. And so like, I've just had right. dipped my toe in the water of that. Just learning a language already teaches you a lot about the right. world and then look at you with five languages so far and counting. So that's awesome. Right. I appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. It always, uh, I always tell that when you, I always tell my students that when you learn a new language, you're not only learning the language in itself, you're learning the culture behind it and how people think and just the uh, different expressions and the way of saying things that we have, right? So for example, the way that in Spanish, you don't, for example, in English, you are afraid, but in Spanish, you have fear, mm. right? So it's a different way of saying that, but it, even though it means the same thing, it conveys a different idea or it kind of lets you know that the two cultures see the same thing differently mm -hmm. right and that applies for so many things and it gets even more wild when the languages are more different apart so i always tell my students that it's uh, learning a little bit of that or the aspect that as you know in spanish we have a formal way of saying you whereas in english it's just always you no mm -hmm. matter if you're talking with your friend with your teacher so that tells you that the culture is very uh mind mindful about respect and being respectful to who you're talking to. So just those little things, even though they might seem uh, minor, they tell you so much about the culture that you're learning about, the language that you're learning about. So I've found that a lot of, throughout this journey of learning languages. That's one of the things I love the most about learning new languages. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. And and the example that you gave us too, like I have fear versus I am afraid. Like you said, it, it, it also... It opens up the the door to explore so much more about like how different cultures view identity, right? Like you said, yeah, it means the same thing. We're essentially saying the same thing. But as a coach and somebody who really likes to explore people's thoughts, beliefs, expectations, and identities, I personally have experienced that where it's like you peel it back and it's like there is a big difference in terms of like mental, psychological identification when you say I have fear versus I am fear, right? And so it's just a, such a tiny little example of, of how language can teach us so many things. So absolutely. Nice. Most definitely. I'm, I'm assuming you and I haven't talked about what you're going to be sharing with us today. I'm assuming that some of this will show up within your story or, 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 or be, you know, run parallel to your story. But before we get into your story and the, uh, the five questions, I always like to start by asking, you know, as you think ahead to the 40, 45 minutes or so that we're going to be having this conversation, what intention would you have for yourself? I would uh, most importantly like to be a part of the podcast because as I've said, I'm a big fan of it. So being a part of it is an important motivation for me. That's number one. But also uh, just being able to share a little bit about myself, being able to tell people a little bit about what being on the comma is like mm. for me, right? And what getting off it looks like. And a little bit about some of the struggles I've faced and uh, how I've gotten through them and my personal story with getting off the comma. Okay, nice. Um, my intention is to support you in that intention by obviously we're going to create this container here that you can can talk freely within. And then by putting your story out there and, and adding you to this amazing community of storytellers that I, I realized we're building through this podcast is that right. someone or many someone's out there will hear your story and they'll see a little bit of themselves in your experience. Right. And in so doing, they'll feel a little bit more connected, maybe a little less alone 
alone and in the best of cases, perhaps even inspired or empowered to do something that they've been wanting to do or make a change or, or take a step that they've been wanting to make. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Nice. Cool. Well, let's get into it. So we've got the five questions we ask in every episode. I'll start with the first question, Gustavo, where have you found yourself sitting on a comma in your life? I have to say that there's been several, several, several situations where I've been on a comma and also off a comma. Uh, right now in my life, uh, I've got a lot of um, stress going on, mostly work related, right? You, everybody mm -hmm. knows and everybody can relate how uh, we are always in that rat race, as you say in English, right? You're always trying to work and make money and... Uh, it gets to be too much, right? Especially when mm -hmm. you're self-employed, as I'm sure you know, and, and as I'm sure a lot of other listeners uh, will relate to. So I'm self-employed. I'm a teacher online, but I am completely self-employed. So I manage my own schedule. I uh, manage my own classes. And when you're an employee and you've got a salary, you're always paced by your employer, right? It's either 40 hours a week or whatever it may be. But when you're self-employed, you are the one who puts the brake on how much you work, right? And I found myself in a situation the last few years where I've been working a lot so much. I've been doing about over 100 hours per week for the last mm -hmm. three years. So seven days a week from Monday to Sunday. I wake up at 6 a.m. I finish work at 10 p.m. So it's been hectic. It's been very, very tough. And the worst part about it, or not necessarily the worst, but um, a part of this is that it builds up into a habit, right? Which mm. is a comma, right? It, the comma is that habit that you find yourself into that you feel you can't stop, right? You feel you cannot just, even though you have the ability to do so and you've got the power as your, your boss, in a sense, you always feel that need to push yourself and work more and more and more. So it's so hard to find that balance. And that's a big, that's the big comma that I'm sitting on right now. There's some other lesser ones, but I think that's the biggest thing that I'm, uh, that I'm finding myself uh, standing on at the moment and hmm. extremely hard to get off. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it. I mean, I could certainly self-reference as somebody who's self-employed, but like what I'm hearing in your story is, is that, you know, there is this choice. You've chosen to be self-employed. We haven't really gotten into, you know, what do you gain from it? What do you get from it? But right now it's creating a lot of pressure because there's this drive to perform and succeed and 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 do well by yourself. And yet it's it's creating these long work hours, this, you know, kind of strong sense of expectations for yourself. And then like you said, like almost starting to not know how to temper or to balance or to pull back when you need to pull back right absolutely and as i, as I was saying it feeds onto itself right because when you start out uh, maybe you'll start out of course at the beginning everybody that has a, it's a, their own business or is self-employed knows that the first few months are tough right you need to put on those extra hours do that extra work but for some people it builds up and it fits itself to the point where even when the business is stable or you've got a stable level of a certain standard of living or of work that is able to be sustained by less work, you still feel that pressure, feel that pressure to go that extra mile. So some people aren't able to break through those initial months where they, they keep that mindset, right? Of they just need to go, go, go. And it's uh, a lot of people go through this. So mm. it's, it's something hard to get out of. And definitely it's a habit that can go for years. Like in my case, it's been going on for over three years now. So yeah, absolutely. It's something that's challenging. When So I, you also use the word habit a couple of times. You're saying this is challenging. Like unpack that for us a little bit more. Like what is the hardest part of this kind of self-employed state you're in and these, these self-described habits that it's creating? So, so usually when you, when I started out and I'm sure a lot of people will relate, uh, when I started out uh, teaching online, I was already teaching in person beforehand, but I started teaching online. And when you start out, um, there's already, let's say a marketplace of other teachers online, right? In several websites or even 
private one-on-one -on -one tutoring. So when you start out on a particular website, or even if you start your own website or whatever the case may be, and this applies not only for teaching, but for any business, but in my case, teaching, uh, you always uh, need to start out, start out strong, right? You need to have a, a wide open schedule so people will be more likely to book you just mm -hmm. because you're you're the new one in, right? So you don't have a lot of reviews, you don't have a lot of references. So you definitely need to start out strong with a lot of availability. And usually you start out with a low pl uh, lower price, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. because you're competing against tutors that have more experience. So usually the more tutor, the more experienced a certain tutor is, the more they are able to charge. So you start out low and you start out with a lot of hours and that starts filling up fast, right? So you start working for a low price, a lot of, a lot of hours, long hours. And then uh, with some months and as time goes by, you start getting uh, into higher prices because you have more experience. Maybe you get some certifications, you're able to charge more, uh, but you still have that, in my case, at least I still have that drive to work and work like I did when I began. So at the beginning, if I was doing 100 hours, what most people, what, what most reasonable people would do would be that they would start scaling that down, right? They would go to mm. 80 and then 60 and then they find a good work-life balance, right? Maybe it's 50 hours for them, 30 hours for them. But for me, I have, I'm, I'm stuck in that mentality where I still need to do 100 hours, even though I don't need to financially, let's say, because as I was saying, I was able to, now I'm one of the top tutors on several of the teachers, uh, several of the teaching websites where I teach, excuse me. Mm -hmm. I'm one of the top tutors in several of those. I have a lot of students in person as well, but I still feel that pressure to keep on to keep on working as I did at the beginning and mm -hmm. start to break out of that habit. Hopefully that that illustrates a little bit of that aspect of that mentality, right? It's hard to break from that mentality just because you have that pressure behind you, right? Even though it's yeah. not realistic, you still feel, well, I've got so many students now. And I need to make sure that they have hours available to book me. And I don't want to lose all of this progress that I've made. So there's a lot of things that play into it that make it a tough choice just to quit. Or not necessarily to quit altogether, but quit uh, putting so many hours into it. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and it's interesting because as you're talking, you know, I'm sitting here kind of personally relating, but also for you in particular, you know, especially as you were going into the, you start out a certain way because you're new and then you got to do these things to start generating the business. Right. And Absolutely. then you generate the business, you get a reputation, you get the skills. Now you start to fill your books, you can charge a little bit more. And then as things, this is kind of the, the traditional path of a self-employed, you know, business, right? Or, or somebody who's self-employed. And then you get to a point where it's like, okay, I'm making enough. It doesn't take as many hours a week mm -hmm. to be able to make that. And so Absolutely. you were describing that and saying, okay, but I have a hard time pulling back. And I was like, oh yeah, a lot of people might do this where it's like, ooh, I can make even more. You know, I, I, I'm charging more and working this many hours, I can make even more, but that's not what I'm hearing you say. I'm hearing you describe some sort of a pressure, something that's compelling you to keep up the hours that right. didn't sound like it was the money once you had gotten to the point of earning the the, the rate that you wanted to earn. Right, not not necessarily because, uh, as I was saying, as far as my living my living needs go, I could work, I could work less. So mm -hmm. it's not that I necessarily need the money, but of course, then the money starts playing into it, right? Even if you don't necessarily need the money, but that's not the primary factor. You're still driven, or in my case, speaking for myself, I'm still driven by that motivation of just being able to be available for my students and mm -hmm. keep going with what I'm doing. Of course, the money starts playing into it in the sense that uh, you, you also want to be compensated by your hard work, of course, as everybody would, but uh, it stops being the primary motivation. I think that at the beginning, when you're just building your business, that's a primary motivation. Get you a point where you're able to pay the bills, right? As mm -hmm. everyone knows. But once you get to a level where you've already got enough to pay the bills, then that's no longer the main motivation. And then other things are playing into it, right? Being a good teacher, being able to be there for your students, being able to provide uh, the hours that are needed for your for your uh, amount of students that you get available. I think that's more what's going on in my case. 
Mm, Because I was going to ask, I was going to ask, like you said, pressure a couple of times. And and then you've said a couple of times now, like being there, being available, thinking about your students, like, I mean, what is what is the thing that keeps you from pulling back? It's several things. Uh, The students. So when I've tried to take uh, time off or to reduce my amount of time, time, time slots available, a lot of students are uh, start asking me, right, like when I'm going to be back available, when I can do classes again. Uh, I'm not sure if I've told you before, I, I travel pretty frequently mm-hmm. uh, in the last, which is a, one thing that I love about this job, being able to travel because it's completely remote. But I found myself in situations where, for example, uh, a couple of months ago, I went to Europe with my father. We went mm-hmm. to Romania, Bulgaria, a couple of other countries. Uh, and it got to a point where at the hotel I was working, since obviously there's that time t- time shift, I was working from 8 p.m. to 6 a.m. And then mm-hmm. I would just sleep two hours from 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. And then I would need to wake up and start exploring because I was in Europe and I didn't want to waste my vacations just being at the hotel. Plus, my dad was waking me up to go places. So um, that has happened several times in several trips. Uh, so it's always that pre- I do, I haven't really taken a uh, day uh, a full day off, unless for health reasons. I've never taken a full day off mm. uh, from working this last over almost four years now. So it's it's a little bit of pressure from the students. It's also a little bit of self pressure, me pressuring myself. I think it's both of those things combined, really. Mm-hmm. Well, and and clearly, you know, as you talk about the amount of time you put into it in the many days, you know, pretty much working every day and very little time off. I definitely hear a sense in you of a passion for the people that you're helping and that you're serving Absolutely. and also something there that drives you some personal kind of level of expectation or belief. Yes. It's also a little bit competitive, right? You're always, uh, for example, on the websites where you teach, you're all, you always want to be the number one to the right, like the one who's got the most classes, the one who has the best amount of reviews. And there's so many things. That's that's why it's hard to get off this particular comma, Paul, because there's mm. so many things that play into it, right? There's the money aspect, as you were saying. There's the comp- competitivity about it. There's the passion behind it because you are passionate, as with anybody who has a business, you do have the passion behind it. There's the pressure from your students, just like any other uh, business owner or self-employed person would have pressure from their clients. Uh, So there's so many things that play into it, which is why it's so hard to stop, right? Because it's not just a single thing. There's so many things all around it. Mm hmm. And and I hear that. And I mean, first of all, I just have to acknowledge you for the dedication and the obviously the kind of the um, what's the word I'm looking for, like the, 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 the grit, the fortitude, like the ability to put in those hours, I guess is what I'm trying to say, and like actually pull this off. Right. right. Um, I, I, I want to go to the second question and then we can continue to go back and forth between the first and sure. second question. There's not it, it, there's no like hard fence there or anything like that. But absolutely. The second question is like, as you look at this comma that you're describing to us, what is that creating for you? Well, as of as of most most recently, um, you know, it's also, and and I kind of want to go back to that second question because as of most most recently, and this is something that plays into that first question, so you don't realize it, right? That's a problem that after a couple of years you don't even realize that it's a problem because you've been doing it for so long that it's just your normal. Mm. So just so everybody gets an idea, my normal typical day, I wake up at 6 a.m. The first thing I do, like I wake two minutes, I wake up two minutes before my first lesson. Mm. I immediately get ready, go downstairs, have my first lesson, and I work continuously from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. every day. Mm. Uh, Obviously, some days I might not be fully booked, but most often than not, I'm fully booked. So if I am, I work from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. So I don't even get a break. I have short 10 minutes, 10 minute breaks in between lessons so I can go to a restroom or eat something or drink. But it's usually continuous work, 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. After that, I get four hours off because I don't work from, well, actually, I better say I have two hours off 
because from Monday to Wednesday, I work, uh, I have two hours off from two to four. And then Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, I have four hours off from two to six. So really, I just get two or four hours any given day for myself, right? I may, I try to go to the gym and keep fit, which is part of the problem, right? I'm not going to the gym much nowadays, mm. and it's affecting my health, right? That I don't have the time. Sometimes I might drive myself to run 30 minutes or do any kind of exercise for 30 minutes. But it's extremely, extremely difficult, and more often than not, it not happens. So that's the first thing that it's affecting. It's affecting my health, my ability to exercise. I don't get much time with family, of course, as everybody might imagine. I might get a couple of hours here and there on the weekend when I've got that, that four-hour break that I mentioned. But more often than not, I just get to eat with my family, if, if at that. Uh, so I don't have much time with my family. So it's definitely starting to become an issue in the sense that I don't get time for myself, my my health, my family, and even for exploring new uh, business opportunities or new ideas that I've got in my head. I just don't have the time for it. So I think that's the main thing that is lost. But after so many years, it just becomes a routine, right? Mm -hmm. And you just take it for what it is. You say, oh, well, that's how life is. Whereas you look at your friends, you look at people all around you, and it, that's not how it is, right? They get... They work less than half the amount of hours that you do, and they have much more time for other things. So you kind of get into you kind of get into a rut, and it's always the same thing. Hmm. So uh, those are the main things that I would say that are lost when you fall into this kind of commas. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, and 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 um, you correct me where I misstate or misreflect something, but it, I also hear when you say you kind of get into a rut, it becomes a habit. You kind of, um, as you said, you don't even realize it's a problem. There's this sort of like resignation to the routine as well, right? Like just kind of giving in mm -hmm. to it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You yeah. kind of give into it and you just accept it as your normal because it's been going on for so many years that it's just it just becomes what is normal for you absolutely so now kind of to to flip it a little bit you've talked about you know what it's creating is some limitations some drawbacks on on that side of the coin i'll ask another question as part of that too is what are you gaining from it like obviously you do this thing there's got to be some things that you're getting out of it too, right? I'm not trying to, I'm, I want to be clear. I'm not trying to like, oh, let's put a positive spin on it or anything like that. I'm saying, let's also explore the opposite. Absolutely. And you're totally right on that. And don't, first of all, don't get me wrong. I love my, my job. It's by far the best job I've ever had. And the best decision I've taken in my life is getting to teaching. I absolutely love it. And I enjoy every second of it. I enjoy my students so much and being able to interact with people from all over the world and teaching. I love my job. That's also why it's hard to <laughs> kind of better balance that with my life, that I love it so much. And I actually enjoy when I'm in class and working. So of course, the number one thing that I gain is just being able to interact with my students, being able to see my students and being able to keep my job, which again, that plays into not being able to stop, right? I love my job so much. And I feel so very much fortunate to be able to have this job that I constantly put pressure on myself. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't want to lose it in a sense, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I always feel I need to be the best teacher possible. I need to uh, be the best review teacher, the teacher with the best number of lessons, because I never want to lose this job because I love it. So I pressure myself to try to be the best and work as hard as I can, uh, which kind of, again, plays into it, right? So as you can see, a lot of play, a lot of these things play into each other. So that's why this is so tough. Um, but things that I'm getting from it, from it, by far, number one, my students, my job, I absolutely love it, and it makes me so happy. Uh, obviously, I earn I earn enough to pay my bills and to be able to uh, provide for who I need to provide and provide for myself. So obviously, uh, that's a big consideration into it as well. Um, and most importantly, I think that, uh, in spite of those two things being the most important out of any job, I also do happen to, I also do happen to, uh, kind of enjoy being dedicated, right? Mm -hmm. Like I know that in the United States, which is very different from Mexico and the way we see it in Mexico, but people take a lot of pride in working long hours, right? Mm -hmm. I always hear people in the United States say, oh, I work 
60 hours, 80 hours, like if it was a bragging contest, right? Which is not the way we say it in Mexico. In Mexico, people are more focused on family and how much time you're able to spend with family and with friends. But I, I do happen to be one of those people that loves to, you know, see it as, a, as an accomplishment mm. to work long hours and being dedicated to my job and being a hard worker. So I'll also get some personal satisfaction and sense of achievement from that. Paul. Mm. Yeah, I definitely I definitely hear the word kind of drive being driven in there, too. I think you kind of made that very clear at the beginning. Right. And and um, it, it's it's interesting. You point out a couple of things, right? Like uh, already you're kind of pointing out some cultural differences between the United States and not just Mexico, many other countries, right? And yet there's a whole kind of right. movement here in the United States where people are starting to pull back from that, you know, hustle culture and bragging about the hours. And that doesn't matter, right? Because this is your story and your experience. So it's about you. And so I definitely do sense, you know, even, even though it creates some stresses for you and some challenges for you, I, I believe I'm hearing kind of a pride in what you've accomplished. And that's that's right. But it's like with a lot of things, right? There can be many things in your life which can have many positives, right? Like we could just as to give a, an example of it, we could compare it to alcoholism, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe somebody is a casual drinker. Maybe he just drinks once a week or twice a week. And it's not a huge deal, right? He goes to work. He's able to, uh, let's say, sustain himself and do the things that he needs to get done. But maybe he bench drinks every weekend, right? Mm -hmm. And there's some drawback drawbacks to that, right? Maybe it's bad for his health, it's bad for his personal relationships, but he still does enjoy it, right? So uh, it's so hard to find that balance, you know, where you're at that point where maybe it's too much and you need to tone it down, even though it's positive and it has many pros. There's always a level, uh, as with anything in life, that in Spanish we say that anything. Too much of anything is bad, mm -hmm. right? So too much of work is bad. Too much of anything can be bad. And I think that's a comma I'm finding myself into personally. Yeah, yeah. In English, the phrase is everything in moderation, right? And so everything in moderation, yeah, and, right. And I hear that. Okay, well, then let's let's take that a step further then. So you're kind of describing the comma. You're describing the current state. How would you like it to be? Like if you if set aside, set aside any of the yeah, buts and whatever, like if you could literally just paint the picture yourself and have it the way you would like it to have it, what would that look like? I think I would like a more sustainable work like balance. So I definitely highly prioritize my work, my students. That's a big priority in my life. That's one of the most important things in my life. But I also obviously the second most or even just as important in life is family, health, and all of the other things that come that come after work. So I would definitely like to put those in on a more even level. So if I could have the way the way I wanted things to be, uh, I would definitely like a I would definitely like to reach a point where at least I have as much time in a, any in any given day, I have at least as much time for myself and my family and those around me as I do for work. So instead of having 12 hours for work and just two hours for family, I would maybe like to get to a point where I would maybe have seven hours for work and seven hours for family. That's what I want to work towards, although I know it's a long road ahead. I need to plan for it. I need to work my way through it. But eventually and with time, that's what I'm looking to achieve. And that's how I'm looking to get off this comma. Mm -hmm. Well, and it starts, I, I love that you've done that too, because it really does start with the vision, right? Like we can't, we know this, you and I have kind of chatted about this in random contexts, right? Like with the coaching and working with people, like you can't right. really strive for something that you can't picture, right? Um, you can't set goals for yourself without an imagination. So you're starting to visualize, right? You're starting to visualize what it would look like. You, you, you're you starting to get specific about how much free time you would want, um, who you would want to spend it with. So, I mean, I just have to acknowledge you for that, that you already have a vision in mind. You had a vision of what success was and, and in terms of hours, students, rates, and so forth. Now you're having a vision of what balance and, and a personal life would look like. Um, what, what's important about that for you to have those things? What would it bring you? 
Well, first of all, I think that it would make me, and again, a big motivation. I think that all of these questions play into the other, right? So we're just jumping back and forth into a lot of them, which is great because I think that a lot of these things go hand in hand. So I think that the number one thing that I would gain is being, uh, actually, I would be a better teacher. And I think that anybody mm. that has a business or that works for themselves can relate. Sometimes when you try to do too much, you get to a point where you're stressed and you're exhausted and you can just, you don't just give your 100% as you know you should or could. So sometimes when I have those late lessons at night, like 8, 8 p.m., excuse me, not 8 p.m., 10 p.m., or when I do early mornings, like 6 a.m. on a Sunday and I'm just exhausted, uh, sometimes it's hard to give it my all. Of course, I always try my best to give it my all because as I've said, I love my, I love my job. It's the thing I love the most in life but sometimes it's just hard and i think that if i were able to tone it down a little bit i think that i ironically i would be a better teacher so sometimes mm. and i think it's important an important lesson for listeners and people all around to know that sometimes you can do too much for your detriment so even though even though sometimes you want to do your best and you're motivated to do your best sometimes less is more that's a big lesson that mm -hmm. i think that i'm starting to realize and aside from that, obviously, the huge benefits are ju of just being able to focus more on my health, working out more, exercising more, uh, being able to have more free time for myself to explore businesses, uh, other business ideas, explore my hobbies and things that I like, and even uh, being able to spend time with family, just putting that time into family and spending time with my loved ones. I think those are the biggest things that would be gained by actually being able to achieve that better work-life balance. Yeah. Well, it, and I think we can tell, I can tell your family is important to you because you they constantly come up in when you talk about what you could have and where you would like to spend time. So I can see yes, how important your family absolutely. is to you. What Share with us, since you brought it up. Um, what what other business ideas? What other what other, other things for you to explore? Or where else would you travel to? Well, uh, the last few uh, that that's actually uh, thank you for reminding me. Travel is another big motivation. So the past few years, Paul, since I've started uh, touring, uh, and since I've started teaching, most specifically teaching online, because as I've said I was already teaching in person before. Uh, I started traveling a lot and I got the travel bug, as you say, as you would say in English, right? And I started traveling. Uh, the last few years, I've been to over almost 70 countries. Mm. Uh, so I've been traveling extensively. And that was something that was very important for me and still is very important. So I've still got a lot of destinations and places I would love to go. Uh, but it's extremely hard to plan, as I was explaining before, with the time differences mm -hmm. and having to work uh, from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. and waking up exhausted to travel and tour around. So ideally, with a better work-life balance, I would like to travel more, explore more countries, uh, business ideas. I've got a lot of ideas going on. So I, I've worked so many hours, right? I do almost 100 hours. So... Uh, actually more than 100 hours a week of lessons. So ideally, what I would like to do, which plays into achieving that goal of being able to do that, um, to achieve that better work-life balance, I've got some business ideas. For example, I would like to, uh, now I'm one of the top tutors in several teaching of the most popular teaching websites online. So hopefully I'd like to start a course for other people who would like to get into teaching and teaching them how I've got into a good standing with a lot of the websites, how I've gotten students, how you can teach other people online, uh, what are the best certifications to get for different languages to teach, uh, some of the things I've learned and some of the mistakes I've made, and maybe just start a simple easy course where people would be able to maybe pay a one of payment or a subscription where they would be able to chat with myself, kind mm -hmm. of like what you do with coaching, uh, but specifically tailored to teaching. And then maybe by means of that or through that, being able to supplement my income to be able to also have less of a financial stress where I could work even less hours. So that's something that I've been thinking about and 
I kind of been wanting to explore, but of course, when you're working over 100 hours a week, it's just impossible to even think about uh, investing more time into any other business. Mm-hmm. But that's something I'd like to explore, hopefully, once I I have a better work-life balance. Yeah. Well, and, and you have a vision for it. Like you already have a vision that you sound like you're, you've got some clarity around, at least in the, in, in the grand scheme of what it is. And it strikes me too, Gustavo, that like what better way, cause you've talked about how important it is for you to attend to or take care of your students, so not necessarily your words, right. But like how much your students matter to you and what right. it strikes me is what better way, if you're not going to continue to give all the students, all the hours, what better way to take care of them than to put additional tutors out there who have your stamp of approval? Right. That's, that's my thinking. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Well, and I'll just insert this too, not trying to solve your problem for you, but it seems like, oh, and who knows where that could go? Like you train enough, teach enough people to become tutors and teachers. Maybe you end up having your own school someday. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's also something that I've thought in, uh, about a lot as well, specifically, you know, with this big boom since the pandemic in Mexico, uh, we've got a lot of uh, digital nomads and a lot of people wanting to live in Mexico. It's ever growing. And specifically with how things are looking up in the world and in the United States with, you know, there's always some political instability, things going on there's more and more people coming in. So I've always thought about that idea as well of exploring that idea of opening up a school where people could learn Spanish or learn mm. other languages as well. Uh, so that's something that I want to explore as well, aside from that idea. So I've got several business ideas that I'd like to uh, explore. And unfortunately, I haven't been able to just because of the sheer amount of hours that I'm putting sure. into work. But absolutely, those are things that I'm looking into. And hopefully in the future, once things settle down, I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll definitely be working on those. Yeah. Well, it's cool. It's cool. You do have these ideas. You're showing us a whole bunch of things, right? You're showing us what, what it takes to be self-employed or, or what it's like for you to be self-employed. Let me be clear. You're showing us what some of the challenges are like for you to be self-employed, which is not uncommon amongst self-employed people. And you're showing us also that despite your current constraints, there are visions, there are hopes, there are plans, there are ideas, which is is truly inspiring too, because I think a lot of times, particularly here in our culture in the US, I don't know if it's true in Mexico, but we tend to really, um, I was going to use the word worship. I think that's too strong, but we (laughs) tend to celebrate and kind of admire and follow the people who have achieved the thing. Right. Right. And, and I don't, I don't believe that we celebrate enough the people who have the vision or who have the idea or who have conceptualized and just, and what it takes to even hold on to those in the first place. Gustavo, I'm going to the, the third question here. And that is, you know, as you look at this comma that you're sitting on, what are you learning about yourself? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, For me, for me personally, I've learned I, I've learned a lot of things throughout this journey, right? Uh, the most the most important thing is that I was I was always told when I was in school growing up, I'm sure a lot of people can relate. I was always told by teachers that I was uh, lazy or that I didn't want to put the work in, mm. right? And I've come to realize that it's not that I'm lazy, it's that I need to find my passion, right? Which I think that's where the school system fails in Mexico, in the United States, and in several other countries, right? You are programmed to learn maths, learn history. Uh, You're never programmed to find your passion and find uh, what you excel at. So when I started getting into uh, work that I actually enjoyed, I found that it was no problem for me to work more than 100 hours per week or 110 hours uh, in my top months. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's not it's not that I'm lazy. And I think that it's not that a lot of people are lazy. It's just that it's hard for them to find their passion. So that's one thing that I found about myself. I've also realized that even though, uh, of course, money is important, work is important, achieving is important. 
family is what's most important, right? They are who is going to be with you at the end of the day. Uh, so it's definitely to have a ba- it's definitely important to have a balance. And I would stress that out for anybody listening. Uh, it's important to it's important to provide. You need to do what you need to do to be able to provide and sustain yourself. But don't overlook uh, those around you and don't overlook yourself and don't overlook your ideas and your passions. Uh, that's something that uh, at, at a point in my life, maybe even right now, I'm still struggling with. So I want to stress that out for anyone, most definitely. And I've also learned that I've also learned that for me personally, as a teacher, I and as I've said before, as somebody that loves their students and loves what they do, uh, you always need to find your limits, right? You always need to uh, realize when enough is enough and not push your limits, which is something that I see a lot, right? I have a lot of students who are doctors, who are business owners, who are um, who are therapists, and they love what they do. They love their clients. They love their their patients. But sometimes not being able to find that balance and trying to do too much can be detrimental to them. So sometimes we've got this idea that we're helping people where we're at a level where we maybe are not at our best, right? Because we haven't slept enough. We haven't eaten well enough. We haven't uh, we haven't been rested well enough for what we need to do. So always find that balance. Uh, finding that balance, taking care of yourself. That's something that I've been learning these last few months and doing more and more, trying to sleep better, trying to eat better, trying to get back into exercise as hard as it is with my hours. So I feel it's important to, to that for performing your job well, it's not just showing up and giving it your 100%. Also, what you do before, the rest that you have, how you eat, how you take care of yourself. That's also crucial and that plays into it. So I've found uh, that it's important to emphasize that aspect of being able to take care of yourself and being ready when you do show up to be able to give it your all. That's something crucial that I've been learning during this process. I mean, it, it, it pans out, right? It shows it shows in everything that you've shared with us. And, and I really appreciate you calling out that piece and sharing with us that piece about, you know, being told that you were lazy because it is such such a complex and and like just packed thing right and and you experience it there people in you know all over the world experience it we definitely feel it here and and it's it's so it's so sad right because the person who calls us lazy is only looking through their own lens right like let's don't even i won't even demonize them although i'd love to but it's like i hate this whole concept of lazy, right? It's such a capitalism thing. And before capitalism, it was there too. But but like you've proven you're not lazy. Perhaps like if we were in a coaching session, I could kind of go there and like, oh, okay, how much of that message is still there driving you when you were talking about the pressure, right? And the the desire to succeed, but but you right. yourself said, no, I found something that I'm passionate about. I found something that I really enjoy. And so you know, I'm sure it's way more nuanced than it is simple, but, but yeah, absolutely. It's like lazy at what, right? Whenever somebody says you're lazy, lazy at what specifically taking this test or doing this class? I don't like this class. I don't like this subject matter. Right. So absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And I so appreciate your call to, you know, knowing your limits. Um, I appreciate that. As well. Yeah. That is such a, a, a big call out. Um, I was I was self referencing because I was thinking about some of our our lessons, right? And I was like, some of the times right. when I've really been pushing myself. What did you just tell me this week? It's like it's a marathon, not a sprint. And I'm like, I need to be told that right. over and over again, right? Absolutely. The fourth question: um, What changes for you as a result of sitting on this comma? It, the, it, normally, I would ask in past tense, but this is present tense for you. So, what do you what do you think changes for you, or will change for you as a result of sitting on this comma? Well, well, uh, you know what? And actually, that's pretty interesting, and that's also why why I wanted to be a part of this. Not only because I'm a big fan of the podcast, but just speaking out loud and being able just speaking out loud really and being able to putting towards my thoughts, mm-hmm. right? Which I haven't I hadn't said before just because it's so hard to find the time to speak with someone uh, when you're working so much. But just after this session, I'm coming to realize a lot of things that I already had in my head, but after I've said them out loud, 
they resonate more with me and I'm better able to understand what what's going wrong really and what's what the issues with this crazy schedule. So after this, I think I'll be able to better come to realization of what I need to do moving forward and really the effects that this has had on me and why it's negative up to a certain point. I think this is the most valuable lesson that I've learned just sitting here with you. Well, I, and I have to acknowledge you for that. For first of all, even having some thought about that when you said yes to the podcast and seeing that, hey, it's not just about sharing the story. Like I might get something out of this too, which is really cool. And yes, I will tell you as somebody who has interviewed, you know, this many people now where you're, you're number 50, right? And, and my own experiences and working with clients, like, even if you don't know where it's going to go, even if you don't know if it's going to turn into a specific set of steps, just getting it out of your head, saying it, writing it, sharing it with somebody, there's huge value. You just you just showed us that, right? Like, ooh, now that I hear I, myself say this, then I, I'm processing it differently or something new will come up for you, right? So just a huge acknowledgement to you for taking that step. And, and, and just allowing like leaving a little bit of room and space for that to kind of like marinate and kind of unfold itself. Right. So I appreciate that. Paul. Very cool. Uh, last question, Gustavo, what does getting off the comma look like for you? Getting off the comma. Wow. That's a loaded question, Paul. That's a great question. Getting off the comma. I think that's what happens after this conversation is over. I think that the way it's going to look. Um, I think I will need some time to reflect on what's being spoken about today, the realizations I've come to, which, as I've said, were ideas I had in my mind, but after expressing them, I'm more self-aware of them. So I think I need to sit down with those, reflect on them, and start taking action, right? Stop, stop just talking and start taking action. So maybe start working on these business ideas that I've had, maybe start toning down a couple of the hours or better arranging my schedule in a way that I have more free time, even if I have to wake up earlier or sleep later, finding some extra time to better organize my schedule in a way that I'm able to start taking some of those steps that I need to take to get to where I want to be and to that objective that I mentioned before of having a more sustainable schedule. Uh, so uh, to be completely honest, I don't know what getting off the comma looks like, but I do know what planning for, for getting off the comma looks like. That's what happens now. Well, let me, I mean, as a coach, let me jump in and it sounds like there's a lot of things to think about. Go with your gut, not your brain. What's the first step? Go with uh, the first step. Wow. First thing to do for me after, after our conversation is over, I'm going to sit down and reflect. I need to reflect on what's being said and I need to really reflect on, on everything that I've said. There's a lot of things to take into consideration, so I don't want to do you know how it is you never want to make a rash bold decision right so i do want to reflect i want to sit down and think about what's being said that's what my gut tells me that i need to still sometimes the gut tells you to still talk to your brain right so that's what i'm going to do i'm going to have that conversation and sit down with it and think about what the next steps are to get where I want to be. You answered your own question because there, there is no right answer, right? Like some people would be like, it's the hours for me. Some people might say it's the new business for me. Some people might say I need to take a vacation, right? You said, no, I need to reflect. I need to review it all. That was your answer that came from the gut. So um, that's right. your answer. You sound clear on that. Absolutely. Nice. Well, nice. Absolutely. Sometimes... Sometimes people tell you, uh, your gut, what does it tell you? And the gut tells you to talk, talk to the brain, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a never-ending story. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. It, that, that too can happen, right? Absolutely. Gustavo, let's, let's wind things down here. So first of all, as you look back at the conversation, thinking back to the beginning when you set your intention, what would you acknowledge yourself for? I would acknowledge myself for the hard work that's being done this uh, past few years, I've done over uh, on some of the websites that I teach. Uh, I've done over ten thousand lessons, uh, more than oh, wow. Yeah, I'm over at ten thousand lessons from some of the websites that I teach. So that's a huge achievement. I've had lessons with students where I've done over three hundred lessons, 
So I think that's a great achievement just because of the fact that 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 makes me happy in the sense that they are they are so pleased with my service that they would continue for over 300 lessons. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's also a, an achievement on my end of how hard I've worked to get a student to stay with me for 300 lessons. And there's a couple of students like that. So there's definitely something that's definitely something that I'm proud of that I think is a big achievement. I've learned a lot about myself, as I've said throughout the podcast. I've come to many realizations. And I think that big, big progress has been made towards I, where I want to be in life, where mm. I want to find myself at in life. Even though some things have been sacrificed and some things have been lost, I think that a lot of progress has been made as to what I want in life. So I think those are my biggest achievements throughout these years. Absolutely. I, I will definitely see your acknowledgement and raise you because um, th like you've invested, right? You've invested the time, you, you've kind of put in the sweat and the tears and so forth. Absolutely. But look what you've accomplished. You've got the achievement, you've got the experience and the tenure, right? You've got um, clearly what I'm seeing too is a, a, a loyalty based business, right? Like that's any marketing expert would tell you that that's worth gold right there that, you know, that you have loyal clients and you have loyalty to your clients. Right. So, uh, I mean, I see Absolutely. these things that that is all like in the bank. That's, that's, um, equity that's that you can leverage. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Gustavo, where could people find you if people wanted to contact you, obviously, you know, to potentially work with you, but also just to hear more about your story or to, to say hello to you. I'll put the information in the show notes. Where where can people find you? So if anybody's interested in taking language lessons, whether it be Spanish, English, Portuguese, they can always find me on Preply. Uh, hopefully, Paul will be able to link that down there. Uh, also, if anybody wants to reach out, uh, personally speak, uh, they can always reach out on LinkedIn. My profile will hopefully also be down there. Uh, so if anybody wants to either take language lessons, they are more than free to reach out on preplay. If anybody uh, wants to personally reach out, they can do so via LinkedIn. And hopefully both of those links will be uh, down below here. Yep, I'll definitely put those in there. And then I know your time is precious. So the last thing uh, is the section that I call acknowledgements. And we do this in every episode because it, it's it's an important part of the spirit of the podcast in general, but it's also a part of your story as well. And what we do here is give you a chance to give a voice to, boost, promote, or lift up other people in your circle who are important to you. That might be a cause or an organization or... Or, you know, another creator or somebody that's personal to you. So is there somebody you would like to acknowledge as part of your, your Ab episode here? Absolutely. Absolutely, Paul. If I may do so, I want to um, give a big shout out to two of my students. So I have two students that I would definitely like to give a big shout out to. One of them is, uh, his name is Charles, Charles Adams. He's a web, web designer. He designed some of the best websites that I've ever seen for businesses, individuals. Uh, and hopefully, if possible, Paul will be able to link his website down below. So if you're ever, ever interested in creating your own website or designing your own app, he can most definitely help you out with that. I've personally uh, known him for uh, years now. He's one of my loyal students, and I've learned so much for him from him. He's a big inspiration to me. So definitely somebody that I want to give a big shout out to. And that's not to say that he's also an extremely talented web designer. He has his own company. So if anybody ever needs help in the in designing their own websites, please uh, consider him. He's definitely a great option. And there's another student that I would love to give a shout out to. That's a huge inspiration for me. Her name is Brandy. She's uh, from Washington. Uh, near Seattle, and she's a jeweler. She makes jewelry, so all kinds of rings and mm. necklaces. She's extremely talented as well. I've seen some of her pieces myself, and she's wow, she's incredible. She has so much talent. Like he has, she has her own business. She sells online, and she, again, personally, she's a big inspiration to me. I've been, uh, she's been learning with me for over a year now. 
hundreds of lessons and she's a very big inspiration for me uh just because of the quality of a human being that she is so mm. i will also uh send a pass the link over to paul hopefully he'll be able to link that down there and if anybody's ever interested in buying some jewelry or uh, having something custom made for their loved ones or family I would definitely recommend uh, taking a look at what Brandy does because she's extremely talented and I think anybody would be more than pleased with her work. Nice, nice. And we will definitely include their information and their links in the notes so that folks can just click directly on them. And Gustavo, I so appreciate you taking the time out to come and share this story with us. I think it's going to resonate with a whole lot of people, um, particularly in today's day and age, as people are exploring options for themselves and taking back control of their lives and and um, and their work. And so I obviously will look forward to continue to work with you as one of your loyal students. And, um, and you and I will be talking again next week. But thank you for coming on here and sharing with us. Us. No, thank you for Paul for the space. I really enjoyed it. Uh, again, I want to finish up by thanking you not only for having me, but all of your guests that you've had on. I think this is valuable work. I think that your podcast is a great different format that's different from all other podcasts that I've heard, as I've told you. I think this is extremely valuable for people to be able to listen to and to relate just with common people around them. And I really enjoyed being on. I appreciate you so much for having me. And I look forward to seeing you again soon as well, Paul, as always. Nice. Thank you so much. I so appreciate it. Have a good weekend ahead. What an honor it is for me to witness these powerful stories. I hope you feel the same way too. Think about what you learned from this conversation. What stood out for you? What challenged you? What inspired you? And I encourage you to write it down in some form of journaling and reflection. Surprises can reveal themselves to you when you do this. And if you were moved by today's conversation, pass it along to someone you care about. Let's spread the word. Let's continue to build connection. And if you do discover something you'd like to unpack further, book a call with me and let's talk about it. My links are in the show notes. Be sure to like this episode, follow the podcast here on this platform and social media at Off The Comma. And feel free to comment and interact with these posts and episodes. Check out my website for workshops, events, and my sponsor community. I'm covering the costs of production by curating my own sponsors who align with our vision. Be sure to check them out. They're all powerful people and businesses. Thank you for listening to this episode of Off The Comma. As always, keep noticing and keep listening.